Hi everyone! Today we'll be talking about one of my favorite groups, as you may be able to tell by the shirt. We're talking Wu-Tang Clan. Now I've had the pleasure of spending the last two weeks listening to their discography to come up with the cream of the crop. I'm calling this, undeniably, the top 10 best Wu-Tang Clan songs. And to stir things up a little bit, I'll have my pick for an overrated song at the end. But in the meantime, let's get to the top 10. At number 10, we have Method Man from Enter the Wu-Tang, 36 Chambers. When the clan's first independent single, Protect Your Neck, was released, most of the members of Wu-Tang were hustling or slinging dope to support their families. The group and their associates would hand deliver the limited run vinyl to radio stations and record stores, and it would catch fire once DJs started spinning that hard hitting joint. Soon enough, major rap labels like Def Jam and Jive came calling, but they didn't understand the Wu Tang vision. Frankly, they didn't get why the group needed to roll nine members deep. Not only that, but RZA, the core architect, insisted that each individual member should have the freedom to release solo albums outside the clan. They would sign with Loud Records after they agreed to this odd arrangement. The first member to release a solo album following 36 Chambers would be Method Man, and his eponymous coming out single would end up on the B-side when Loud re-released Protect Your Neck. The legend goes that there was a rap battle between all nine members of Wu-Tang, with the grand prize being a solo joint on their debut LP. And wouldn't you know it, M-E-T-H-O-D Man won the honor. Method Man shows why Meth would end up one of the biggest stars of the clan. He already had Hollywood charisma. His hoarse, almost guttural voice was dynamic. Over crashing piano chords and RZA's dusty turntable beats, his rapid delivery slings inventive bars, and on the chorus, he sings his name, punctuating each letter. Method Man would become the master of hooks for the group. Chances are, if you remember an earworm refrain from one of their songs, you have Mr. Meth to thank for that. Method Man was a coming out party for one of Wu-Tang's brightest rising stars that showed his keen ear for wicked rhymes and catchy melodies. At number 9, we have Unpredictable from 8 Diagrams. Flash forward almost 15 years later, and RZA was trying to wrangle the entire clan back for what he intended at the time to be their final album. A lot can change over that much time. The crew had grown and evolved as artists and had worldwide success. However, tragically, Old Dirty Bastard died of a drug overdose in 2004. Wu-Tang was supposed to be forever, but with ODB gone and six years since Iron Flag, what did Wu even sound like? In the years leading up to 8 Diagrams, RZA had become an in-demand film composer. What started with his work on Ghost Dog led him to create scores for Kill Bill and Afro Samurai. The beats he was cooking up for the next Wu LP couldn't help but be influenced by his soundtracks. He was no longer making lo-fi loops. The tracks were heavily orchestrated, with lush cinematic details and silver screen flair. It's hard to please everyone though, and both Ghostface Killa and Raekwon weren't really feeling the new direction, and subsequently don't appear as much on 8 Diagrams. While it may not have the old school signature Wu-Tang sound the duo spoke of, the album is a thrilling and brave reinvention. On Unpredictable, Inspect the Deck put it another way. Wu-Tang, keep it fresh like Tupperware. A trembling string section straight out of Ennio Morricone gives dramatic tension to the rhythm, aided by heavy bass from Shavo Adajin from System of a Down. A ripping, fuzzy, funkadelic guitar solo fades in and out. As Ariza chants the hook, Wu-Tang is unpredictable! before unleashing one of his tightest verses. He rhymes, snatch the sword from the rock with one hand, one finger, bzzz, turn your body to sand. And with the raging, intense production, it sounds like a righteous warrior riding into battle. Unpredictable is an adrenaline rush shootout in IMAX 3D, and a clear highlight on one of Wu-Tang's most slept on albums. At number eight, we have Wu-Tang Clan Ain't Nothing to F With from Enter the Wu-Tang, 36 Chambers. The early roots of the Wu-Tang were a bond between three cousins. RZA, Jizza, and ODB all shared a family tree and the love for hip-hop. They were in a crew before RZA and Jizza signed and released albums for major labels under the names Prince Rakim and The Genius, respectively. But both would quickly be dropped. The brief inside look, though, would be a wealth of knowledge for RZA as he plotted a new group with friends he knew from the projects of Park Hill in Staten Island, NYC. Beyond recruiting the dopest rappers, he had a wide-eyed plan of uniting the 5% nation lessons learnt on the block with Eastern philosophy, heavily borrowed from kung fu movies. Early on, this created a mythos of Wu-Tang as something more than a hip-hop collective. They were larger than life comic book superheroes. RZA's production would come to define East Coast hip-hop. He would take deliberately gritty, deep soul cuts with the sound of the needle dragging along the vinyl and chop and digitize them to make abrasive, hardcore street beats. 
He would also pioneer using samples from out of left field. On Wu-Tang Clan Ain't Nothing to F With, he uses the theme song for the Saturday morning cartoon The Underdog. Do, 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 do. And stripped of context, it sounds ominous as the clan chants the title alongside. When the beat drops, a creeping bass line and fresh hi-hat break give the loop funky driving momentum. The minimalist groove is hypnotizing, and while the hook may be initially heard as intimidating, the vibe is undeniably fun. The group calls out the haters while repping the 36 chambers proudly, flexing their considerable lyrical might and making it sound that as long as you're on their side, you're certainly welcome to the party. On Wu-Tang Clan Ain't Nothing to F With, the clan brought their tiger style to the masses with a dope, hard-hitting anthem made for the crowds to put their hands up in the air and fly their W. At number seven, we have Uzi, Pinky Ring, from Iron Flag. In the years following their blow up, Wu-Tang expanded beyond music to become a legitimate worldwide empire. There was their Wu Wear clothing line, selling anything from sweatshirts to cologne. The brand would collab on a sneaker with Nike. And they would even release a fighting video game for the original PlayStation, titled Wu Tang Shaolin Style. They were boom times financially. The clan had become such big entrepreneurs, it couldn't help to keep them from their day jobs. There was a gap of four years that separated the group's first and second album, and then another three years before they hit back with their third. Certainly, there was a ton of solo joints released in between, with RZA often producing the majority of tracks on them, but they would take their time returning to write the next chapter of their alma mater. So it was a surprise to many when only a year after their excellent third album, The W, Wu-Tang Clan were already back with their fourth Iron Flag. Uzi Pinky Ring was the banging first single. RZA did some crate digging to pull out a horn cue from J.J. Johnson's film score to the black exploitation flick Willie Dynamite. Utilizing this sample, he recruited an entire band, guitar, bass, drums, keyboards, and horn section, to vamp on the loop. The result is infectious. Swinging horns and phased out wah-wah guitar over an excited drum shuffle. And the whole crew is on point and on fire. Every member of the Wu-Tang, except ODB, who was incarcerated, contribute a classic tight verse. Jizzus specifically wields his liquid swords like a true ninja, delivered in a brutal fashion with simplicity. Over bold, stuttering beats, Uzi Pinky Ring ignites into a triumphant, brassy, marching band fight song that'll have you yelling the Wu-Tang rally call, Soo! At number six, we have Demystery of Chess Boxing from Enter the Wu-Tang, 36 Chambers. While some labels were apprehensive in signing a group with so many members, the greatest strength of Wu-Tang was their chemistry and the distinctive personalities of each MC. RZA was the magnet and beat mastermind behind the click and an underrated, filthy-minded rapper. Jizza was a methodical rhymer with an encyclopedic vocabulary. Old Dirty Bastard was the wildcard showman who could veer from rhyming into singing on a dime and hit the note. Method Man was the chronic coffer with a hoarse vocal cord, tight flow, and knack for effortless hooks. Raekwon was a streetwise storyteller that could tell a full tale with a few short strokes. Ghostface Killa was perpetually hot-headed with a furious, fast-paced flow and a master at adding intricate details to his bars. Inspector Deck was an S-tier MC, both deeply cerebral and linguistically elite. You God brought that rhythmic, booming braggadocio that always injected more life into a joint. And Master Killa was a low-key track murderer who would conserve his verbal barbs to attack with surgical precision. When they came together like Voltron, there was a reason no one could touch them. Their words were weapons great, and like chess masters, they were always thinking several moves ahead. Prior to 36 Chambers, hip-hop was dominated by Dr. Dre and West Coast G-Funk. Those slick productions were the antithesis of RZA's messy, imperfect basement beats. Enter the Wu-Tang would bring the ruckus back east, with a viscerally heavy sound straight from the underground. On the mystery of chess boxing, the whole posse shows why they are untouchable. You God sets the tone coming out guns blazing, and from there, you could really see the group's hungry, past the mic mentality. Nearly every member gets a verse, and they are trying to one-up the one before them. Both ODB and Ghostface give career-making bars, full of fire and passion. It wraps up with an exclamation point by Mastakilla, the last member to even join Wu-Tang. On his first verse ever written, he goes straight for the jugular. Merciless like a terrorist, hard to capture. The flow changes like a chameleon, plays like a friend, and stabs you like a dagger. With the crew rhyming over a sparse, minimal beat, with a demented harpsichord line played by RZA and inspired by jazz giant Thelonious Monk, the Wu-Tang legend was fully formed. 
The mystery of chess boxing is hard-hitting battle rap, with every man involved at the top of their game. At number 5, we have Rules from Iron Flag. This is the only song out of the top 10 to not be produced by RZA himself. Though he was a relentless workaholic who literally made thousands of beats, he also nurtured a group of talented in-house producers, collectively named Woo Elements. For the first time on Iron Flag, several tracks would be produced by these students, without any input from RZA. One standout from the album, the hypnotizing Y'all Been Warned, would be produced by True Master. Another one of those protégés was Mathematics. Wu-Tang's resident DJ, responsible for the Dex Live, and also the graphic artist who designed the iconic W logo that is as recognizable as the Golden Arches. In the documentary of Mikes and Men, a completely essential watch for Killer Bees, RZA said he paid Mathematics a measly 400 bucks for the design, which seems a little cold-blooded. Hopefully he bought the man something nice with the residuals from all that Woo merch. On Rules, Mathematics Production puts his DJ skills to use, utilizing the b-boy classic Funky Drummer to add James Brown's animated grunts to a dynamic group that combines call and response horns and slick electric guitar with turntable scratches and self-referential Woo samples. Ghostface Fiery Verse directly references the 9-11 terrorist attacks. Clearly emotional, he yells, Who's the man behind the World Trade Massacre? Step up now! And over a confident, strutting rhythm, the rest of the clan make it clear. If you come for the kings, you best not miss. Rules is an undisputed trunk-rattling banger that still sounds fresh over 20 years later. At number 4, we have Shame on Anna from Enter the Wu-Tang, 36 Chambers. Clearly that's not the original title of the song. However, when they tried to release it as a single, they couldn't include a racial slur. So that's what they decided to call the radio edit. For somewhat obvious melanin-based reasons, I'll refer to the track as that. Shame on Anna is one of the most immediate, catchiest songs on 36 Chambers due to its urgent, upbeat horns and ODB straightforward but stealthily effective hook. There's no way Wu-Tang would have flown as high as they did without Dirt McGirt. To a certain casual fan, Old Dirty Bastard might have seemed like a Flavor Flav comedic hype man, when in reality he was without a doubt one of the most talented members in the group. His flow was unpredictable, filled with sharp, inventive rhyming and soulful crooning. True to his alias, he really was a son unique. ODB is the most tragic part of Wu-Tang's story. So musically gifted with a kind, thoughtful soul displayed in interviews, but plagued by personal demons that would cause erratic behavior and an early death. Both Method Man and Raekwon have flawless verses on Shame on a Nut, but the spotlight is stolen by ODB. Beyond the song's swaggering hook, his raw verses begin and end the jam with breathless boast of his lyrical dominance. And when he rhymes, I come from the old loco style with my vocal, couldn't peep me with a pair of bifocals, his unwavering confidence is infectious. No doubt due to its heavily censored title and hook, Shame on Anna didn't get the radio love it deserved, but it's an energetic blast of hip-hop bravado that will never fail to get the party bump. At number 3, we have Triumph from Wu-Tang Forever. Once Wu-Tang broke through with 36 Chambers, it was time for Phase 2 of the Master Plan, the first wave of solo albums. Prior to their second album, Method Man would release T-Cal, ODB followed with Return of the 36 Chambers, then Raekwon dropped Only Built for Cumid Links, after that came Jizza's Liquid Swords, and Ghostface Killa's debut, Iron Man. All of which are hip-hop classics, and somewhat crazily, were all produced by RZA, in an inspired creative streak that hasn't been matched by anyone since. With so many solo joints, it would take four years for the clan to release their highly anticipated second album. Wu-Tang Forever was a 112 minute double album that can't help but feel bloated and overlong. Still, it sold like gangbusters, and its high points are some of Wu's very best. Triumph was the first single, sprawling over 5 minutes and featuring every single member of the clan, their only song to do so, plus an appearance by Capadonna, a mentor of You God, and originally slated as a member of the group if he wasn't in the clink at the time they officially formed. The members take turns, flowing over a lurching beat and creeping tremolo strings. It was a smash hit with a blockbuster over-the-top music video that cost nearly a million bucks to make. Yet the song has no hook or repeated phrase. It's straight fire. From Inspected Deck's tongue-twisting bars, I bomb atomically. Socrates' philosophies and hypotheses can't define how I be dropping these mockeries. Through Raekwon's nimble rhymes, adjust the dosage, delegate my clan with explosives, while my pen blows lines ferocious. It's verse after verse of linguistic legends sharpening their swords. 
Triumph is a driving epic that feels like the group taking a glorious and well-earned victory lap. At number two, we have Gravel Pit from The W. After Wu-Tang Forever, more solo joints came through rushing like elephants. In only two years, they would release eight albums, including debuts for Inspect the Deck, You God, and RZA, with his first Bobby Digital album, as well as the second albums from Raekwon, Ghostface Killa, Jizza, and ODB. Method Man would release two different albums in that time, one with Redman. Somehow, between all of this, poor Master Killa was biding his time, waiting for his chance. While certainly not every single song was touched by RZA, he still produced a majority of the beats, which is insane because during that time he suffered not one, but two floods to his Staten Island apartment that caused him to lose hundreds of beats, yet he still had enough ammo for eight albums. The media seemed to worry that releasing so much was causing them to lose popularity by saturating their own market. But the eulogies for Wu-Tang were premature. Dropped in late 2000, their third album, The W, was an assured return to form after the excess of Wu-Tang Forever. While RZA had certainly invested Wu funds into the state-of-the-art production, it wasn't super slick and maintained that rugged edge. It was the new Wu for the new millennium. Kicking off with the fanfare from James Brown's It's a Man's 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 World, RZA invites you to the titular gravel pit, a strange invitation that most of the clan members didn't really understand. The bold beat drops with a shimmying stride and a floating flute line lifted from a French TV miniseries. The soulful chorus sung by Paulisa Mormon is mesmerizing. Check out my gravel pit, a mystery unraveling. Meth, along with You God, both rock the bells and shout out Park Hill on reliably stellar verses, while Ghostface completely murders the mic. With his rhymes coming so fast, it sounds like he isn't even pausing to take a breath. With a swaying back and forth rhythm, three dominant rappers spitting in their prime, and an unforgettable intoxicating hook, Gravel Pit is a place you want to return to again and again. At number one, we have Cream from Enter the Wu-Tang, 36 Chambers. It might seem like an obvious pick, but the more I consider the options, it's really the only true choice. For one, it's the song that really broke Wu-Tang into the masses and added Cash Rules Everything Around Me into the Urban Dictionary. But even more than that, Cream embodies the true spirit of the clan, being raised in impoverished inner city slums and hustling their way toward the American dream. In the early 90s, the police in Staten Island were known as enemies of the hood. Early on, members recalled officers harassing young black men on the daily, some even just children on the playground. In 1994 in Park Hill, Ernest Sayan, a 23-year-old black man, died after suffering head trauma while struggling being detained by the police. It was only 6 p.m. Neighbors saw it all go down and called it what it was, racial profiling leading to the murder of an unarmed man. Eventually, all charges against the officers would be dropped, leaving the neighborhood to grieve without justice. It's a story of police brutality, sadly all too familiar today. Even 20 years later, Eric Garner would die in a very similar manner in the same borough. Those mental scars linger. On Cream, Raekwon and Inspect the Deck colorfully paint the sad reality of the streets in concise turns of phrase. Inspect the Deck laments, It's been 22 long hard years. I'm still struggling. Survival got me bugging. I'm alive on arrival. He counts his blessings that he's still breathing. The cascading minor key piano line gives their blunt storytelling even more gravity. While the mood is somber, the head-knocking bass-heavy MPC beats and the promise to kick the truth to the young black youth feels powerful and uplifting. Don't forget where you came from and go out and take what's rightfully yours. Much more than a get money anthem, Cream is a poignant portrait of marginalized young men taking their hard knocks and fighting to survive in a crooked world. It remains a stirring, timeless hip-hop masterpiece and it's Wu-Tang Clan at their very best. And now, I'll add two more songs that almost made the list. The first is A Better Tomorrow. It's the best song on the first disc of Wu-Tang Forever and such a classic cut that they would use the title once more for another LP. On their second album, the group was already showing mature growth. On A Better Tomorrow, they warn of the pitfalls of life's vices that they've seen firsthand break up homes and derail lives. You can't party your life away, drink your life away, smoke your life away, because your seeds grow up the same way. It's a hard one hook, trying to break the cycle of depression and poverty. Produced by Fourth Disciple, another graduate from Wu Elements, he slips seamlessly into Wu's hazy ambience with a romantic theme taken from Romeo and Juliet. Filled with empathetic snapshots, it's Wu doing what they do best, telling stories and dropping science. The other near miss would be Do You Really Thang Thang, another off-the-hook guerrilla anthem courtesy of mathematics. 
Based on an obscure David Porter sample, he unleashes a dramatic digital string arrangement that leads a stampeding, hard-hitting rhythm. He chops up the beat when Inspector Deck appears, the breaks contrasting with Deck's stop-start cadences, before the groove smooths out and rides. Along with another catchy hook, courtesy of Method Man's Midas Touch, Do You Really Thang Thang is another stellar, dynamic banger that definitely deserves to be mentioned among their best. Finally, let's talk about what I consider to be the most overrated song from Wu-Tang, and that is Diesel. It might seem odd to call a song overrated when it's probably only known by the most seasoned of killer bees, but somehow Diesel has found its way onto two separate greatest hits compilations from Wu-Tang. And I gotta ask, why? It's a pretty lackluster jam that was given to a soundtrack for a reason. It wasn't good enough to go on Wu-Tang Forever, and Wu-Tang Forever was nearly two hours long. The beat doesn't have that blunted, endless atmospherics that we expect from the Wu sound. The shuffling MPC drum loop plods along with a tired, simple, two-note bass line, and that is practically the whole production. The usually game MCs seem to channel that autopilot spirit with decent but fairly unexciting grind almost as if they were kind of put in as placeholders that they never bothered to revise. Or maybe they just never remembered to. Every member had so many tracks in the fire at any given time, it was probably easy to forget. Diesel isn't a totally bad song. I wager that any track featuring Raekwon the Chef in 97 was probably pretty decent. However, it's just a slight footnote. And when it appears right next to legitimate top shelf hip hop classics on the greatest hits collections, it sticks out like a sore thumb. I don't know who made that decision twice, but to me, Diesel seems to be overrated. As you're still watching, I wanted to share a deep cut as well. I try to highlight non-album tracks, and one of my favorites is Let Me At Them from the Tales from the Hood soundtrack. But despite claiming it's a Wu-Tang Clan song, it's really just a dope Inspector Deck solo joint. Definitely put it in your rotation, but I felt I had to pick one where it seems like more of a group effort. So instead, I'm shining a light on Put Your Hammer Down. It originally appeared on a Funkmaster Flex mixtape, and at a little over two minutes, it's a fly firecracker beat produced by RZA with a battle royale of six different members of the clan passing the mic in rapid fire succession. With a flowing, grindhouse score aesthetic and free and easy bars from Shaolin's finest, Put Your Hammer Down is a lost gem. If you haven't heard it lately, you should check it out. So there you have it. That was undeniably the top 10 best Wu-Tang Clan songs. So, how wrong was I? Do you agree? Do you disagree? What's your list look like? Do you think Diesel is one of their best songs? Let me know. And if there's any songs I missed, let me know in the comments below. Hope you stick around, and thank you for watching. that will make you uh, okay. returning to re uh, died after suffering head trauma uh, trauma struggling being taint uh, portrait of me uh, okay. it's been 22 long <laughs> okay. into woo's hazy ambience with a uh, that will never fail to get the party bump I don't know you said party. oh did party I bumping. <laughs> 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 <laughs>